Welcome to the Rich Wizard Podcast, episode 150. Can't we've made it to a buck and a half. For Thursday, the 16th of November, 2017, this is a show where two lifelong friends and their cel- and their guests in their celebration guest about geeks. Uh, what? What's going on right now? I don't... Like five times I've made it. I've, I've cleaned that out five times. Hey, man, we have a guest tonight. Uh, yeah, dude. I am so pleased to welcome to our show Dave Fitzgerald, who you might know as either Buckeye Fitzy or the legal geek what's going on dave well i am happy to be here gentlemen uh are, are you sure about that Cause... well you see <laughs> you hit 150 episodes and you get the the affiliate status on twitch and then all of a sudden you can have good guests and <laughs> that'll start next week so sorry to all the listeners. Uh, he has seen more than one and a half episodes of this show hey uh kent how's your week been man Oh man, busy as hell. Um, my youngest son is in basketball, so we've had a couple games this week. So it's been kind of crazy. One right before showtime, so I was rushing around like crazy. Um, but I've had time to watch some what I would call guilty pleasure movies. Uh, movies that Basic Instinct. Well, mm, okay, not that t- not carnal guilt. <laughs> Um, but movies that, you know, everyone knows that I love Star Wars and, and mm-hmm. you know, the Marvel movies, things like that. But movies that people might be surprised that I like. Uh, I watched um, uh, The Girl Next Door, which Ooh. a lot of people don't realize is one of my favorite movies of all time. Alicia Cuthbert. Oh, man. Oh, yes. Um, I, I love her personality. She's yeah. so uh, witty. And her, just, her acting skills in 24 were amazing. All three <laughs> scenes that she was in it. <laughs> yeah. hey, she had to carry some really important scenes there she, in 24. She like. did. And, that, and that's not even a lie. That's like she. <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a Knight's Tale was another one that I, that I watched. Okay. Uh, absolutely adore that movie. Uh, so good. But I was wondering if, if, uh, if you guys have guilty pleasure movies, movies that, that you absolutely love and have seen 30 times, but maybe people wouldn't expect that you would like something like that. Ooh, Dave, you go first. Yeah, I got one. <laughs> uh, love actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, right. I can... I, there, there's no good reason for, for a male to love that movie as much as I do, but man, <laughs> it is just, it's just, it sums up just life perfectly. And, and for some reason I, I can't get enough of Hugh Grant being, you know, basically himself. So. Mm. Wow. Okay. Yeah, um, okay. I, I can't say plus, that I've ever plus, really cared you can for remember Grant, what but... Rick looked like before he was on The Walking Dead. So, <laughs> bonus. <laughs> there, you go, there we go. <laughs> Sun Bun, thanks for the follow. Um, I'm going to go. Okay. So, mine aren't so much a secret, I guess, but just a reaffirmation of two of my favorite movies of all time that there's no reason they should be watched ever. Uh, and that is <laughs> The Lion King, the original animated movie by Disney. I know that movie line by line, and if it's on TV, you can forget that I even exist because I'm watching the movie. doesn't matter where it starts. I'm watching it all the way through to the very end credits when Rafiki comes out and does the, ah, oh! uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I can't not watch that movie. And um, Caveman with Ringo Starr. And is oh it Sally God. Field or Sally Struthers or Sally somebody or other? Um, that movie I never watch it without just being so completely dumbfounded at my own stupidity for loving that movie. I I, I love it. I God, I love that movie. <laughs> That's fair. I you know I'm I'm a bit surprised that you listed Lion King as a guilty pleasure. I thought that was uh like just public knowledge and. Not only public knowledge that you like watching that movie, but public knowledge that that's a fantastic movie. It's it's pretty amazing. Hey, uh, yeah. that was the actual actually like the first mandate you and I went on was to go watch The Lion King, from, with my from, mom and yeah, like we double dated your mom for that movie in the theater. <laughs> uh, it was pretty great. <laughs> but yeah, and it, that's it, where it all began. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I used to, I used to have like Lion King sheets in the dorm room. Um, like I was all about Lion King. Fucking love that movie. I, I watched it so often. I I went through three VHSs. That's how often that movie movie was playing. I had oh. I had I had actually went and bought a VCR specifically so that when it got to the end of the tape, it rewind and start playing the tape over again. <laughs> like that's amazing. That's uh, so. I mean, I okay. So I guess my guilty pleasure isn't the movie. It's how much I love that movie. Got it. Got it. <laughs> cool. Cool. D- Dave, what did you find time to do this week? 
Well, one thing I didn't put in the show notes that is fascinating is you brought up Lion King. It made me think of it. So Lion King has been made into a musical, and mm-hmm. I'm not a musical guy. My wife is. I'm not. But I go to musicals with her. Your because, wife is eh, a musical a, guy. Got it. Something like that, exactly. <laughs> and, and it's a nice night out on the town, so fine. We go to musicals. We went to Wicked, which is the Wizard of Oz offshoot mm-hmm. about a month ago, and that's fine. I'm not a Wizard of Oz fan, but it, it was a good story. And that's all I really ask. And then my wife hooked me on the Hamilton soundtrack. Mm. And my goodness, is that right up my wheelhouse? Because obviously I do the law every day, so I'm kind of a nerd about the history. And it is such a good story and so well written that even someone like me, a musical pleb that doesn't really enjoy the stuff, like I'm listening to that instead of podcasts on the way home. And this is like really a breakthrough (laughs) for me to to not be listening to podcasts nonstop. So just saying, if you want to drop some Hamilton references or you hear me dropping some Hamilton references, I'm sorry. It's just oh, my yeah. jam right now. Um, um, so when mm-hmm. my daughters came out to visit for the summer, uh, my daughter, Ashley, the 15-year-old, she got me hooked on the Hamilton soundtrack. And I've probably listened to that. As far as music goes, that's probably the highest played music on my phone since that point. Uh, probably more Hamilton than every other type of music combined. The only thing that trumps it is podcast. Yeah. yeah. My exposure to Hamilton, even just musically, is near zero, actually. <sighs> um, my, like, like everyone around me, especially like the podcasters I listen to, they're all about it. And mm-hmm. I don't know why I have not indulged. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to rectify that very soon. It, it's well, Spend yourself 10 bucks on iTunes. Change your life forever. Yeah. Because <laughs> I just, it's, it's crazy. The killer part that is sounds that like the, a bargain. the killer part is the music is actually good. Like if, if it wasn't speaking of, of historic events and host, historic people, it would still be good music. But then you wrap that up in with history that I'm already, in, uh, that I'm already enchanted with. And, and I love the, the revolutionary era and everything else. It's yeah. You, you're getting, you're getting me on two fronts and it's, it's really good. Yeah, and right. I didn't buy into the hype. I just thought, oh, well, you know, Lynn manuel Miranda is a, a good writer and everybody's freaking out because it's maybe the first time a musical has a competent rap soundtrack or whatever, but it's it's incredible. So the I'll transition the other stuff that I'm into every week. I'm into Hearthstone, and so I, I won't bore you with that, but uh, I'm, Dills is sort of a, a loose member of the same community, and so I'm in his Hearthstone league and happy to say that that's going well, but that's always a nice little diversion. Um, and then I got through uh, the first half of the first season of Star Trek Discovery this week, and I started rewatching uh, the premiere on the big screen. I've been watching it all on the iPad. I have my complaints as a Star Trek fan about it being on CBS All Access, but as far as getting new Star Trek on TV, I really couldn't ask for much better. I mean, this is modern Star Trek, and it's very good. Um, it's really all you could ask for if you were a Star Trek fan. So it is worth the subscription fee then? Yeah, so I would recommend the five ninety nine instead of the the ten dollar plan, just because the commercials there's maybe three in an episode. They go for a minute and a half. It's really not that big of a fuss. I mean, if you watch YouTube right. videos, you're already used to that crap anyway. <laughs> right. So yeah, I I would recommend spend the six bucks, get a month subscription, binge watch it, and then cancel, and <laughs> you're good to go. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was thinking exactly doing that, uh, but not buy a, a month subscription. Just get the what is it five day free trial? I think. Oh, it's true. Just yeah, you binge it in that trial. Time. Um, yep. I I do have to ask though. Do you watch anything on CBS All Access other than Star Trek? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one purpose for that, and that's Star Trek. All right? <laughs> it's yeah, self, yeah, yeah, yeah. Self-driven I mean, it purpose. Would, it would be the reason for me getting it, but I think I'd stick around probably for some of the like nostalgia stuff, like uh, the shows I used to watch in the 80s. I'd probably binge a couple of those. Mm. Yeah, I, if I didn't have Netflix, I mean, it does have all the Star Trek, all five of the other series as well, so it, it gives you access to those. It gives you access to... You know, stuff that people find popular, like Big Bang Theory. We Guilty pleasure of ours is Survivor, and I don't know why we got back on that after not watching it for 10 years, but we're back <laughs> on it. And, and you can watch that on there, too, but we have cable, so, you know, I just yeah. DVR. <laughs> okay. <laughs> got it. Uh, nope. Um, speaking of things we watched, I did finish Stranger Things 2 uh, over the weekend. Actually, like, Friday, Friday, I think, because it's a holiday. We all just stuck around and fin- finished the last three episodes. Um... Overall, I would say it wasn't as good as the first season. 
Um, but there's more of a continuum, and it, it rounded out the story better than the first season did, which I think was necessary for the first season because of the the inevitable, are we going to keep going? Um, but now, now it's kind of secured that it's going to be a, a longer, you know, a longer series. Uh, I think the second season really, really gave you a lot of a lot of the story that wasn't there before, and it really opens it up to multiple branches. It, there's not just one single single stream of of, of thought that you can go down. Um, there's you know you you could actually take it off in about three different directions and have a good series uh, to go with. Yeah, totally. And the uh, actually, Dave, have you seen season two? No, I haven't, but in this case, oh. I'm not worried about spoilers, so don't worry okay, about well, that. Okay, well, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to spoil anything anyway. I was just, I just want to point out to Amos that, what is it, episode six or seven or whatever, where it kind of goes off mm -hmm. to something else? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I saw that absolutely 100% as set up for season three. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Regardless of where what happens if, with the main characters, you can go on that route and, yeah. It, it, that, that actually, the way that storyline finishes the version was very unsatisfactory to me. And yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it I mean, like... some people say that it that it adds to the you know at the end with uh, you know eleven feet like you know what, well pun and pun not intended there, uh, but like the the power and how she's able to focus like mm -hmm. that's that provided reason for that. But I don't think you needed a whole episode to establish that. Mm. Yeah, I, I see it as completely just uh, storyline. Uh, set up for season three, and also just kind of like a world building, right? Uh, aspect show you that there there's more than just what's happening in their tiny Indiana town. Right. Uh, we get about halfway through the through the series, and, and my wife is like, "Are we sure this is in Indiana?" <laughs> I was like, "Yes, babe. Like I recognize half the shit on here." Well, you didn't grow up in this town, I'm like no, but I recognize the the the, the sheriff's it's badge. The next town over. Yeah, yeah. The sheriff's badge is the same in every town. Uh, you know, like it's. Yeah, it's just it's just little things like that, you know. The power lines are like their power lines are different in Indiana. I don't know why, but they're they're slightly different in Indiana than they are anywhere else. And um, <clears throat> so so I finished that. Uh, that was on Friday night. Saturday, I got up and was getting ready to do some FAFSA with my daughter because she's getting ready to go to college. Uh, oh, and so one FAFSA is dumb. It's I understand yeah. that it serves a good purpose eventually. But the actual yeah. process of it is just stupid, and and and, but, the, and the caveats that that entail. Uh, any, okay, anyway, uh, without getting into, oh. it's like doing taxes, but doing them for the first time ever. But and you happen to have a large family and several homes. So here's the, here's the thing though. It's specific. Okay, so I I I make way more than my ex wife does. I I make way more now than my ex wife has ever made in her life. Yeah. Um, and part of that is because the loca locality I'm in, the military gives you certain benefits for being in high cost areas, things like that, blah, 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 blah. None of my income counts towards my daughter's FAFSA because she didn't live with me for at least half the year. Ah, oh, crap. Right. So yeah. basically she's going to get full benefits of someone who makes 120,000 a year because my wife and I, we, we here. So, but it's, <laughs> it's just completely stupid. And like even tax code isn't as retarded as FAFSA rules are, and it took it took us about half as long to understand the stupid rules. Um, I don't but, know. I think you're underselling the tax code there, Amos. <laughs> 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 Probably not untrue. Um, and then that was immediately. So we get about halfway through that process, and I start getting a headache. Well, yeah, as do all of us, but you have a right. uh, you have extenuating circumstances. Well, so I, I I started getting a headache. The headache was followed on by, by cold sweats, by shivers. Now, our house is unreasonably warm. Like, I can't stand how warm it is in our house right now because I'm a, I'm a hot body, right? So, um, I, actually, I have my little thermometer right here. Each one of these is four degrees. And I like it when the green one's all the way down and all the others at the top. So, we're at least four degrees warmer than what I like it right now. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I was just dying. So, I went to lay down. I realized as soon as I laid down, everything was fine. Okay, well, then I get back up and get in my chair, and all of a sudden the world is going. Okay, so I lay back down. Everything's fine. So 24 hours later, I decide, well, 24-hour 24 hour migraine is enough for me. I'm going to go to the ER, and I cruise the ER, and apparently any time that they mess with your spine in any, any way, shape, or form, you can get what's called positional headaches. 
a, a spinal headache. Mm. Essentially, there's an imbalance in, in cerebral fluid going between your spine and your head, and your brain doesn't like that very much, so it starts basically causing pain everywhere to let you know, hey, something's wrong, and then you lay down, the balance is restored like the fucking force, and you feel fine. Mm. So that lasted until this morning. Um, and I got to tell you, so uh, let me, let me, let me, let me show you something here. Headache med, nausea med, back med, headache med, headache med, headache med. I am a walking pharmacy right now with active prescriptions to drugs you can't get on the street. Well, I mean, you could. Not legally. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that's, that's the point of going um, to the street. So, yeah, this last week has just been a, a, a days of dizziness and sensitivity to light. Yeah. So, you said up until today. Right. Right. Yeah, this morning, so, this morning the, the, the spinal headache finally subsided, and I just had a normal migraine, which was brought about by... Uh, uh, dehydration from all the nausea and not being able to hold any water. And that finally went yeah. away. And so I've been chugging like three gallons of water today, trying to build myself back up to normal hydraulic balance. Right. So, so you, are you good now? Uh, hopefully. Think, or, yeah. I mean, okay. I, I don't feel nauseous and I just had a Mountain Dew to help with the, uh, the little bit of headache that's left over. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah. If I make it through this episode, we should be fine. Excellent. Uh, that being um, said, I did have uh, to cancel like three podcast recordings in that time, though. So that, that was kind of a downer for me. So it, in lieu of, of doing podcasts and, and having headaches, I decided to try streaming a game on Twitch. What, and uh, what game? I actually did it. What game? Uh, I actually streamed a couple of them. Uh, just nothing, nothing crazy. And I didn't even stream for a very long time. Uh, but I... Just I downloaded Steam and I downloaded a, a couple of free games that I thought looked interesting. Just to try to you know just try out my tech and all that stuff. Um, they're called uh, Iron Snout, which is like a a pig fighting game. And uh, <laughs> okay, and then the other one was more fun than it should be. It's called Expenda Bros, and it's basically playing off of Expendables. Because the the cartoonish characters look very much like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone and and uh, like eighties action heroes, uh, but it is stupid, stupid fun. Uh, but the the good news out of all of this is that I figured out all of the tech stuff on the first run through. Uh, I have I, I set up a green screen, so I got the the chroma key filter set up on OBS. First time, did it right. Everything was just set up right. Everything worked the first time I pushed the button, and it was, it was incredibly satisfying. Wow! So this, the 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 big news on this one is that Kent did tech by himself. Yeah, yeah, go me. <laughs> of course, I had no viewers or any any interaction whatsoever. So, <laughs> but uh, but it was fun. It was it was pretty cool. I might I might do it again in the future. Nice. Uh, uh, Dave, what kind yeah, of geekiness it, did you get into? Expenda Bros sounds. Oh. It should be an entourage property for what it's worth, but uh, but we'll digress from from there. So the nerdiest <laughs> or geekiest thing that I did this week, I've got three daughters, so you know prayers are, are appreciated. <laughs> no, I, I feel you completely. <laughs> they are uh, they are currently still very young, so we're we're not quite to the real stress yet. But uh, the oldest one is nine. And she's basically my only son uh, because she is into <laughs> all the nerd stuff. She is over the moon for Star Wars. So when we went to Disney, it was equal parts visiting Disney princesses and visiting Kylo Ren. And thank God for her because that <laughs> that's sanity for me. But uh, she and the family got into Pokemon Go last summer, uh, as I think everybody did. But then we're one of the few people that still play. And we play because the kids really enjoy it. And they, you know... And it's cool because I never really got into Pokemon. My wife never really got into Pokemon, even though we're the right age group for it. And it's kind of been a way for me to rediscover all the stuff that I did. I missed when I wasn't paying attention to Pokemon. And they're just so passionate about it that it's like, 
we've started to get into other Pokemon stuff. And one thing that I did do as a kid for many years was play Magic the Gathering. So we recently got them some Pokemon trading card game cards. And again, being a Magic Pro, you know, I so to speak, I know, you know, okay, mana cards, energy cards, we need these to kind of build some decks. And right. uh, so I had to go to the local card shop, which I hadn't been at in quite some time. And you know, and the guy took really good care of me, he got me a bunch of energy cards on, on the cheap, which was nice. So I didn't have to go to an online retailer, but it just was like a trip down memory lane, you know, going to the shop and, and a bunch of card players there. And I'm like, hey, guys, <laughs> you know, here I am in my business suit and tie coming from work. It's weird. I know. But <laughs> can you get me some energy? So that's one thing that I, I noticed about games that are, you know, technically in the geek world or whatever. You know, you play uh, Warhammer 40K. I've never played myself, but I can just step into a room where people are playing and i can easily grasp what's going on for the most part you know the nuances are, are different but if i you know having played magic the gathering i can go in and watch somebody playing a, a, a an equivalent card game and can catch the flow of the game and even though the nuance is lost on me the the actual flow of the game is still there and that's that's one of the things that like if you have any geek credit at all you should be able to walk into a gaming store and know at least one one of the games is going on and how how like oh shit they're losing like <laughs> right yeah you know it's funny that you were talking about your exposure to pokemon and the trading card game kind of being your most recent one my introduction really to pokemon was the trading card game uh the, the like, like i'd known that pokemon exists but i didn't really pay any attention to it whatsoever until my i, I think my oldest son was like seven and my youngest one was like four or no, that's 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 not right. Probably <laughs> four and ten, something like that. Uh, they were talking about wanting to play this game, and I was like, okay, Pokemon, sure. So we went and bought a couple of the like you know pre-built like starter decks, and uh, we learned together how to play it. And that was that was my introduction, and it was one of my uh, like I guess fondest like bonding experience memories with my kids um so yeah so pokemon is not as shitty a thing as i thought it was <laughs> well and it's fun you, you mentioned that because it is kind of passed down i remember how i got into magic was my father taught me and just kind of on a whim thought it would be something i'd be interested in it wasn't i mean he was a dungeons and dragons player so he never really was into the card right. games but he yeah. took the time over like a christmas break and again i had divorced parents so i didn't spend a lot of time with him but that was one of the things he spent the time to introduce me to and it became yeah. you know a 20 year passion or 15 year passion passion for me uh, both as a hobby and and sometimes beyond that and then you know for me to be able to kind of pass down that you know geekiness to a kid that is much on the same track that yeah. i was you know even though it's a different game and a different ip it's still you know it, it brought up those kind of warm memories you have like mm. uh, when you were on the other side of the table so yeah, uh, yeah. I think Magic: The Gathering came out like shortly before you and I went into the Air Force, Amos. Um, so I remember it. I remember seeing it once or twice right before we came in in '95, uh, and then as soon as I got to my first duty station, it was all the rage. Yep, yep. Um, well, you and I, you and I started playing it in tech school. Yeah. Well, we 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 touched on it. Well, actually, yeah, we, we dabbled. We yeah, dabbled. We, we actually dabbled with like three different versions of it. I, I, we saw people playing Pokemon and we're like, okay, that looks dumb because it's Pokemon. Um, and we saw people <laughs> playing a magic and we're like, okay, there's already too much people going in there. And uh, Hikiko Morukurugi, whatever. Oh man, I, man, we got to have better names. They're easier names for me to say. Thank you so much for the follow. Um, the, uh, we, we saw all these people playing these games and we're like, okay, well, we got to pick up one. We started playing the Star Wars version of it. And we thought it was great, but then we both went to go and uh, uh, like buy more packs, and we're like, "Oh shit, dude! We've we've both bought like ten packs each in the last three days. Uh, maybe maybe we should yeah. hold off on this." And yeah, yeah, that was very short lived for us. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of broke airmen having to walk to the card shop off base because there are no taxis that wanted to go that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh man! So we have a few ways that people can support our show. Uh, one of the coolest things that people can do is he, right here on twitch.tv slash ritual misery, which yeah. is our actual new name. Um, Sun, Sunny can actually attest to this. They released all the old justin.tv names uh, mm -hmm. on yeah. what Wednesday morning or something like that. And as soon as they did that, I remembered I owned ritual misery on Justin TV, but I had 
way lost 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 the the password to it and everything else. I was like, oh, I can go reclaim that real quick. And I ran down here to the computer, headache just bla- blazing. Got in here and changed it from Ritual Misery podcast to Ritual Misery because we like to have Ritual Misery everything. Yep. Um, and got that changed, and we are now twitch.tv slash Ritual Misery. And I couldn't be happier, even though it apparently fucked everything up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll fix the glitches. Uh, but no, it's, it's super cool. So check us out, twitch.tv slash Ritual Misery. Uh, give us a follow, please. And if you can, uh, go ahead and give us a, a subscription, especially if, if you are Amazon Prime and you do not use your Twitch free subscription that you get every month, go ahead and click that button to link a, a Twitch account to your Amazon Prime and uh, go ahead and click that subscribe button for us. It's, it's completely free. It's exactly. uh, $2.50 out of Jeff Bezos's pocket. Uh, so that would be much appreciated. We have one other place that uh, that we would love to send people, and that's patreon.com slash ritual misery. Check yeah. us out there as well. Um, real quick, I've noticed some people this last month have either dropped their pledges from Patreon and sub- subscribed to us on Twitch or lowered their pledges on Patreon and subscribed to, to us on Twitch. Either way, however you want to do it, whatever works best for you, we are completely yep. happy with. Eventually, Kent will get to push out some uh, uh, Patreon free or Patreon exclusive stuff out there. Um, he did this fact, week finally. <laughs> yes, in fact, I did. I did push one out. Uh, not not with the door open this time, uh, but I did push something out <laughs> just directly to the patrons. Uh, it was a story that I told a few weeks ago in the post show that uh, a lot of people actually over the last couple of years have asked me about it, and I finally told the story of my uh, brush with a beer god. And if, if that's something that uh, you think you might be interested, head over to patreon.com slash ritual visitor and check that out. And now it is time for... You've got 60 seconds. Get your mind right. It's time for Hot Takes on the Ritual Misery Podcast. Oh, yeah. All right, Dave. So this is hot takes. You have about a minute to respond to these things. Uh, I'm going to give you a topic, and then you respond however you want, whether it's a, a rant, a rave, maybe it's just a one-word response. And then you're going to hear this sound. The record scratch means that you stop talking about that subject. We go to the next one. Are you ready to play? Yep. Got All my right, records Dave. ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dave. Classic video games, am I right? Absolutely. Super NES is the best. There you go. <gasps> Patent trolls, am I right? Ugh, they're the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. They're just sucking out all the systems. Yeah. <gasps> Pokemon Go, am I right? Ugh, I mean, you want some exercise? You will walk your tail off getting that silly Dragonite candy, I tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> Michigan Wolverines, am I right? No, you're not right. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that requires a go box in response. <laughs> <laughs> and the Ritual Misery podcast, am I right? Absolutely. Diamond Club, represent. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah. Awesome. All right. That was hot takes. Thank you, Dave, for playing along. Thank you, Dave. So that last one started out as a gratuitous self-indulgence of just getting our, you know, just saying the podcast name in the middle of the podcast. And thus far, only one person has been like, no, no, fuck yeah. this guys. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't even remember who that was, but that was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, but, but they weren't wrong. Um, so now we'd like to turn our attention to uh, one each, Dave Fitzgerald II. Uh, the Gen Plays, thank you for the follow. And uh, we'd, we'd like to find out more about you. Like you are, you now, are you like an actual like patent trademark lawyer, or are you just like the clerk in the front that like directs people which office to go to? No, no, not a receptionist. I'm I'm fully vetted with with the law degree for better or worse. Uh, my my clients uh, will have their own opinions about that, but <laughs> but nonetheless, yes, I've been a patent attorney for about ten years now. Um, I work in private practice, just do law firm work. So I work for many different masters. It used to be partners, but now that I am one, now I just work for a lot of different masters that pay me, pay my bills. Um, and they're called clients, but, but anyway, masters, uh, I do customers, a, whatever. Patrons. Yeah, exactly. you know. 
I'm a mechanical engineer background by trade. So that's, you know, I'm doing refrigeration systems, aircraft, uh, you know, gearhead type stuff is, is my background. And that's what I write patents about. And it's just one of the most fulfilling things ever to, you know, basically everything I do every day on a technical side is fresh. It's new. It's what the companies are working on. And the law, sure, it doesn't change that often. So you're making a lot of the same arguments. But I got into the career because I just wanted to always be learning and, and seeing what's new. And that has not disappointed even after 10 years. So that's me on a professional basis. Um, as far as other things in the community, I think the most natural thing to start with is Legal Geek, which I started uh, selfishly is is just a way to try to get on a frog pants show and uh, <laughs> and success uh, achieved. I, I was actually uh, hoping that was that was your answer. That was, that was like yeah. <laughs> that was gonna be my <laughs> yeah. guess, but I was like, no, that there's no way it was exactly that. So, uh, <laughs> so no, su total success achieved. I'd been a fan of Scott for a while. I'd, I'd bugged him about you know maybe doing a, a very occasional TMS segment because how much do you want to uh, ruin your morning show with legal topics? Uh, but you know, I'd pitched him on a couple of things. We'd talked back and forth and I just said, you know what, you're bringing current geek back. That fits exactly what I wanted to do, which was have a more nerdy focus, talk about, you know, board game lawsuits. And, you know, yes, yeah, sometimes we cover the big Supreme court cases on, you know, abortion and healthcare, uh, where I think it's warranted. But for the most part, I'm dealing with just nerd topics, which is the stuff that I want to read about and I'm interested in anyway. And that's the stuff all my friends ask me about for the most part. So Legal Geek is is an excuse to both be on a Frog Pants show, but it also kind of guilt trips me into staying up to date <laughs> on all my news sources as well. Um, so it did have more purposes than just putting out content, but it's been super fulfilling uh, over the last few years uh, to build up you know, a network of, of friends and contacts within Frog Pants and Diamond Club. Um, it's definitely been been a boon. I don't know, quite frankly, if it's brought any business or not. Nobody said, hey, I heard you on Legal Geek and I want to be your client. Um, but I guess that's a possibility, too, down the road. Who knows? Uh, I mean, if it, if, it, if it nets you one client, it kind of makes it, it worthwhile, right? Right. Especially if you enjoy it. I mean, yeah. it's... For me, it's I mean, a pastime. I know that if I'm ever going to want to patent something in the future, I'm definitely calling you. Well, it's, it's good to know. Uh, now, now the the problem is Kent's still working on that auto door shutter for when he's in the shitter, the 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 shitter shutter. Uh, he, he's still working on that. Oh, I, I wasn't supposed to say that, right? That was a trademark name. Um, the the thing that gets me though, and the reason that I find your segments so interesting, and therefore find you in you know recursively interesting, is that you you don't just go on there and, and have a two to three minute spiel on whatever the high profile case is. A lot of times you won't even talk about the legal aspects of it. You'll talk about the procedural aspects of it. And that interests me just as much because, I mean, I, I'm, I'm the one that everybody said should be a lawyer, but I clearly don't have the, the tenacity to write papers that long. So um, it just, all of it overall interests me, but then you keep it on that, that geeky side. Even, even when it's a non-geeky topic, you'll talk about the, the legal procedures of it, which turns it into more of a, a legal geek actual aspect of it. And I love it. Yeah. And I, I try to break things down in the English language. It's one thing that all attorneys struggle with is actually speaking English. And we'll get to that later with the TED talks where we're going to talk about, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a real struggle. And I feel like there's not an opportunity for me, given where I practice, if I were a criminal defense attorney or a tax attorney, I could find plenty of pro bono work. I could go help lots of people, but quite frankly, patents are kind of business assets for the most part. And they're very expensive as far as fees go. So there's not a lot of opportunity for me to get back to the community. And, you know, this is one of the ways I can do it is by educating. So I, I give some seminars at game conventions um, on IP law for game designers as well uh, every summer. And, you know, that's a really good excuse to business expense uh, origins and Gen Con for what it's worth. But, uh, but I digress. <laughs> there's, all, there's always side benefits to these things. Uh, yeah, but no, and and again, it's just you make a lot of connections by you know, and it might be indie game designers who never you know become anything, famous, guys who become the next great thing. But you know, the fact that you helped them out, uh, that's and educated them on some extent. That's that's what makes me feel happy. And and I think it's like a lot of people, a lot of attorneys will do that free pro bono work to get that same feeling. I just don't have that opportunity. So this is the way that I try to give back to the communities I value. Yeah, very awesome. I'm I'm 
curious, how did you approach uh, Scott Johnson about uh, adding content to Frog Pants? Uh, was it just like basically through a submission, like you you just sent out an email, or did, how did that go down? Yeah, so again, we can get into various passions of mine, but one thing that I, I was passionate about listening to podcasts was I was beginning to to tinker a few years ago with making some content. And I don't really have, especially with the kids now, I don't have a lot of time to do my own show. It's in fact, I used to be a sports writer for the last 12 years about college football, and I've given that up this year. And I've made it through all the season okay. I'm just doing okay. I'm telling you, I'm doing okay. <laughs> Tell myself hey, every day. Hey, guys, I, Twitter, see your, right? I see your left eye twitching a little bit right there. <laughs> no, <laughs> okay? no, let me take a drink. I'm doing, doing okay. Mm. I promise. I'm making it through. I'm doing okay. I don't have to write about everything. I promise. Um, but no, and doing that stuff, I decided, okay, well, you know, these shows that I like, I can't, you know, make my own show, but what way can I give back? And I started with This Week in Trek, which is, um, if you're familiar with Frog Pants and, and TMS, Daryl is the Trek nerd on there. It's his Star Trek show. So I'm a big Trekkie, started listening to him. Matter of fact, I think that might have been my tie. That in the instance kind of where my tie where I figured out what Frog Pants was. Uh, but I listened to their show after about 40 or 50 episodes, which was five or six years ago. I started doing a two minute segment on characters on Star Trek for them. And they like embraced it right away, threw it in um, and have done it weekly, like I said, for the last six years or so. And that kind of gave me the boldness to then say, OK, you know what? If I can do it for those guys, maybe I can do it for, you know, a bigger fish like like Scott Johnson. Uh, and again, I wanted to do something that was kind of legal, kind of geeky, and it just it all kind of came together when Current Geek came back from its hiatus. It was just that perfect fit. So as far as how I did it, I'm pretty sure I just recorded a segment, sent it to Scott and kind of said, hey, can you play this on the show like you do with the instant segments? And he's like, yeah, this sounds cool. I'll do that. And then I just kept sending it and he kept playing. <laughs> it. No. So it was pretty simple. Did, did you ever submit to the instance? Was that a thing that you did? Because I seem to remember... Um, so when current geek came on or came back and you had your little segment at the end of the show, I like, you were familiar to me for whatever reason. And I used to listen to every instance episode, even if I couldn't play the game, that was my wow fix. So did yeah, you know, and no, I didn't do any segments on there. So. Weird. That's just a, a fallacy of my memory, apparently. Yeah. But there are a lot of instance segments over the years. So. <laughs> so there, there are some episodes where the, the, the segments at the end are, are half as long as the episode itself. So, yeah, and th there's there's a lot of so, uh, so AIE in general has a lot of talented people and a lot of very nice people. Uh, AIE is Scott Johnson and Veronica Belmont's Wow Guild. I don't know if Veronica still plays a bit. I know Scott does. Um, and they they have AIE. I uh, I I, 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 oh, I can never say it right. Uh. Um, Alia Yakta S. There, see that that's it. And um That's that's why you brought me on the show, so I could say the Dias cast in fancy language. Exactly. So that's that, why that, I'm here. I was about to get to that. The Dias cast is, is essentially what it means. Um and it's it, it's an amazing guild, and it's very helpful if you're playing World Warcraft or really any gilded game. Um I recommend getting getting on there and doing that. Um but I forgot what I was going for. They, uh, there's a lot of people in there that do things at the end of the instance, and it's not always the same people that are doing the little segments, but they're always awesome. And there's a lot of work that goes into some of them, like a lot of work. Yeah, I know the mm -hmm. production quality on some of those is crazy. I'm getting crazy feedback, and I don't know why. But we're going to leave it in the show because that's, that's how we roll. Yeah. Um, Kent, uh, other than, other than current geek, uh, where would you uh, have found good old Dave Fitzgerald II? Um, you know, that's uh, that's really the number one place that I know Dave from. In fact, Current Geek was one of the earliest podcasts that I listened to. You're Therefore, welcome. Dave, you are one of the one of the most long listened to podcasters, like in my uh, young young listener life. <laughs> If that makes any sense, I just rambled for like twenty seconds. I that have was, no idea what that I was. That was awesome. I was really hoping to put Ken on the spot, and he came through. Um, so <laughs> you, you two actually have something in common that I don't think is very common amongst people. And can you guess what that is, Dave? No idea. Okay, uh, Kent, can you figure out what that is? Um, I, I don't know. We're a couple of Midwestern boys that 
Um, no, there's a uh, lot of those. There's, there's all kinds know. of Midwestern white guys. I mean, that's... They, <laughs> uh, you were both the second. Oh, ah, okay. ah. And there's another... Yeah, we're not juniors. We no. are the second. Yeah. That's the very true. Matters. <laughs> very true. I, I ho- just... however, am not Esquire. One of us might yeah, be, but it's not me. What, I mean, what yeah, does this... Esquire even mean? Like, that's... I don't know. It's a snooty title. It's it's what it is. It's it's when it, if you want to tell when an attorney is a real prick, um, yeah, just look for the Esquire. That's that's pretty good giveaway. <laughs> put that on the David Fitzgerald the second Esquire. Esquire. Oh. Yeah. It's like David or, Fitzgerald the second. I'm a douche. Or if they refer to themselves as doctor, because I'm sorry, it's a technically a, a doctorate, but come on now. Like, like, <laughs> wow. Hey, um, we have some things going on today. Uh, a lot of the, the, the most downvoted comment in Reddit history occurred this week. Oh, my God. I'm, you guys must have heard about this, right? They talked about it on DTNS, uh, yeah. like pretty much the entire internet is talking about this. Uh, just a couple of days ago, like this is like this news is like two, maybe three days old at the most. So Star Wars Battlefront Two, this highly anticipated game from EA. Uh, you know, a lot of people have their their EA prejudice or whatever, but Battlefront Two, for all intents and purposes, looks brilliant. Uh, yeah. So a lot of the early players, I guess, uh, I guess they were beta testers right they got this game like the full version of the game well if you and... pre-ordered the game you got to play two days before everybody else okay so that's what it is right yeah. so pre-order had the... like a 48 hour exclusivity on being able to play right so a lot of the content that you would expect to find in the game like a darth vader playable character was only available through uh, i guess a loot box system kind of like what you would expect to see in uh, like Overwatch, that's that's right sort of thing. The more you played, Where, you got certain points, and the points would add up to you being able to unlock certain characters. And right, or the, you could, or you could do micro purchases where you right. spend real money to get like fake gold to purchase the loot boxes, right. etc. Uh, so this one redditor just put a very very small uh, comment on Reddit and said, "Seriously, I paid eighty dollars to have Vader unlocked." No, you know, to, to, have, to react- have Vader locked, because you paid eighty dollars for the game and Vader was locked. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's an expensive ass game. It's it's not just like your you know forty dollar game or whatever. This is an eighty dollar game. This is a premium title, mm-hmm. and then you don't get the whole game. So then, you- e- then EA community team came back with this really long bullshit argument um, that got downvoted six hundred and seventy six. Thousand times. Thousand. Thousand. That's six digits. <laughs> EA's response was very corporate, basically saying that, you know, hey, you know, uh, the intent is to give you a sense of achievement when you unlock these goals. And, you know, I'm sorry that it yep. wasn't, you know, you got impatient or whatever. And, but, you know, he, but here's our game and we think it's a fair system, whatever. Yeah. 600 plus thousand downvotes. Immediately, yeah. like less than 24 hours after this thing was live, they yeah. locked down. Reddit locked the post so that people could stop commenting on it. The previous, uh, the previous total was like 53,000. Was the previous winner of the the most downvoted? Yes. It was like so it swamped it. It was within yeah. 12 hours. It was like 300,000 downvotes. It's currently at 676,000. They've locked it. Um, and just today. Uh, EA released a, a statement on Twitter saying that they are locking all micro purchases before the game goes live, so you can't even buy your way into it. That they're going to reevaluate the entire system. Like this is community action taking place. Uh, and I, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't played the game. I forgot to pre-order it. Otherwise, I'd be playing that right now. It's not talking to you two losers. Um, I, I don't know how much impact this actually has in the game, but I do know that that when you get six hundred thousand people separate accounts saying "fuck you." You better listen. And EA finally listened. And this might be the first time in the last 15 years EA has genuinely listened to anything a consumer yeah. said. Well, and the thing is, this isn't just bad press. I, I forget the number now, but a shitload of people that had pre-ordered the game started canceling. Asked for their money back. Yep. yep. Canceled their pre-orders. Like a shitload. I, God, I wish I... I don't know. If somebody can in chat can look that up for me because I'm, I'm too lazy. 
Uh, but it, it was a lot of people. It, it was a, a hugely financial uh, impacting thing to EA. So they right. had to address it. They had no choice. I mean, you figure after they survived SimCity 4000 or 2000 or whatever, and the, the charades with that, and then when Battlefront 1 came out, and they, there's problems with that, with people getting their, their systems locked or unlocked or trying to share disks, and they were just like, you, you can't share disks. Well, and, and also, you know, Battlefront 1 just kind of sucked. Uh, it, it was great for about two hours. It was really, really good for about two hours. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's it exactly. But yeah, th- this is one of those things. Um, Dave, what what are your feelings on uh, on on EA finally listening to the community on like on this? Well, I'm not surprised. You know, half a million people or more speak for themselves, even if they're angry redditors. That's still just a, a mass of people that they can't ignore because they are consumers for the most part, and they will lose sales. Uh, and at the end of the day, these companies do listen to the the almighty dollar, uh, for better or for worse. I found it more interesting that the the EA support tech was just so tone deaf and e- even making the comment that way. Uh, I mean, you had yeah. to know they were going to get lambasted for just putting out that corporate BS. And I'm happy it happens just so that we could see the community in action. I wonder, though, and I think the bigger concern here is long term is this going to be the new normal? Is this going to be accepted by gamers? Because the quid pro quo up till now has been, if I pay 50 bucks or more likely 60 bucks, or if you buy a premium edition, 80 bucks or 100 bucks for a box title, I'm going to get a game. I'm going to get you know Zelda. And yeah, there might be DLC for the Zelda game later, but that's fine. I get a fully functional, awesome experience. And I'm using Zelda as an example because I'm playing it right now. Uh, But same thing with Super Mario or Star Wars Battlefront or any of these. You're buying the game. And if I pay 99 cents or I download a free phone app or I go on Steam and get get a game like that, then sure, fine. I mean, if you want to nickel and dime me, if I want to you know pay to win in those types of games, that's fine. That's what we're used to. And that's how they make their money. But to combine the two is not something that is very common. And it just that's the worry for me as someone who's a consumer in this marketplace, that that's going to become the new normal and that's going to become okay. And then it it makes the question, what are we paying for? Why are we paying so much money up front if you're just still going to basically paywall us or make us grind? If I wanted to play World of Warcraft, I'd go play World of Warcraft. Yeah. Yeah. So my my kids get on me a lot because I'm 40 now and I've got teenage kids they think that I am the most ancient person. So I, I've become the, you know, the old man on the porch screaming, get off my lawn. You know, that's very much me in, in certain ways. Uh, one of the things that, that I, like, I will hold to, this, okay, this right here, all right, this is an SNES cartridge of Super Mario World, one of the greatest freaking games in the history of games, period. All right? This game, well, it came with the system, but if you were to buy this at the time, it was probably what thirty bucks. 30, I think thirty 40. was the standard at the time. Yeah, yeah. So you got the, you paid your money for the game, and this is the complete game. This is all there is, all there ever will be of this game, and it is complete, and it is perfect, and it is fucking awesome, and it still remains one of, like I said, one of the greatest games ever freaking made. Nowadays. I have to you know, download the game probably, so I don't have a physical copy that I could turn around and sell. Um, I've got a, a just a downloaded copy of this thing that is not even ready on launch day because come launch day, I'm gonna have to patch it, so I'm gonna have to wait an hour for the for the thing to download and update. And then once I launch the game, I'm waiting, waiting. It's loading, it's loading, it's loading, it's loading. And then I get into the game and it's asking me to, you know, to sign into some some crazy ass account. And then I probably got to play the game online. And then I've got to wait for the, the game to start because I'm waiting for all these other people. But then if I want to catch up to where these people are that started playing 37 minutes before me, I'm going to have to make a biker purchase to get a loot box in order. Oh, my fucking God. I just want to play a good fucking video game. <laughs> like, what have we become? Like, ah, it is so hard for me to get into modern gaming because of shit like that. Kit wants to pay the merchant some money and play a damn game. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that, no, that's that, dude. That is so 1987. All right. Yeah, I know. Uh, and instant too. Like I turn this thing on. I put this in my SNES and turn it on. 
30 seconds later, I'm already halfway through level one. <laughs> you know? Um, M Beam in the chat uh, sh- shot this over to us. This is their uh, their latest reaction. Uh, and I'll, I'll let you read it yourself. He's got the link there in the chat room. Um, yeah. it's, it's a much better, more thought out response. And it clearly should have happened something like this the first time around, but it didn't because corporate. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that, that whole, that whole thing, man, I just, uh, we can't get half a million people to agree about the best way to, to do politics, but we can get half a million people to say, fuck you, EA. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, people say fuck you, EA for a, quite a while now, but this is the first time like United front, like fuck yeah. your game. Uh, if you want to make money on this thing, you better fix it. Yeah. Um, I honestly haven't cared about EA since they canceled the NCAA football game series. So I'm just saying, like, <laughs> like that, that ruined it for me. And it's not their fault. It's really not their fault, but it's still, it ruined it for me. Oh, geez. Uh, there's some more happened uh, in social media this week. Dave, would you like to uh, introduce this little bit, this little tidbit of, of juicy knowledge? Yeah, so for you uh, current geek listeners, this is a spoiler because this is what I'm going to be recording a segment on later this evening. Uh, I found this story interesting. Basically, Twitter has gone through uh, and reevaluated what they do with the verified check mark or whatever you want to call it, the badge that they put on. Uh, at the very beginning, it was kind of a really uh, stringent process to get a verified badge. You had to be a celebrity or a journalist or something along those lines where they could verify your identity. And then it was just really a source identifier that, yes, you know, this is the real you know, whoever, the real Donald Trump, the real Miley Cyrus, whatever, you knew you were following the real. And then it became more of a, you know, just a verification badge that anybody could apply for. And, and so, you know, maybe the lower level people that in the grand scheme of things, like the Scott Johnsons of the world, who have fame of their own right, but they could get verified. And it's just kind of made the line real foggy as to what does verified mean. And interestingly enough, uh, I guess there was enough of a pushback on Twitter that the verification tag was taken that they were somehow approving the tweets of those people that were verified. And uh, and I don't know whether that's a, an appropriate viewpoint, but that's certainly part of the justification for them to now pull back and say, hey, we're going to reevaluate how we do the verified tag. And furthermore, we're going to pull it off people that are violating our rules, our terms of service. And one of those rules is what they deem hate speech. Now, what's interesting about this and why I'm going to talk about Twitter and its terms of service is how far can they go? What, you know, what right do they have to basically impinge on the speech of, of their users? And the, the spoiler answer is they can do whatever they want, just like any other social network. Um, but the first kind of targets of this hate speech being pulled down for breaking the rules happen to be commentators on the far right. Um, so regardless of your political views, I kind of bend down the middle, but I don't really think either side, even the fringe of either side, should be squelched, per se. Or at least if they're squelched, they should be equally squelched, because they're both really annoying to listen to on Twitter, and when they get retweeted <laughs> into my timeline. <laughs> but yep. nonetheless, that caught my eye. And that's how it's being played in the media so far, is that, hey this is the first wave and these are the types of people that are getting pulled down. And it's just, that's a little troubling just in its inconsistent nature. But again, you know, they can define hate speech however they want and it's their platform. Uh, I do think Twitter would be a better place without some of what happens, but at the end of the day, Twitter is, is the chance for us to react viscerally to things that are happening in real time uh, as well as a news gathering service. So you're, you're going to have to put up with some of that. It's just like Reddit comments that are just complete garbage. It's the internet. You have to learn to filter it and deal yep. with it. Exactly. <sighs> yeah, that's no, you, man, I had, I had comments going through my head. I was like, Oh, this I'm going to, Oh, no, he just said it. Oh, I'm going <laughs> to, Nope. He just said it. So yeah, I have nothing to add to this. I, oh, sorry, I, I'm thinking out my segment here on the show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, I'm 100% Feel free you. to re- re- to refer back to this uh, this Twitch uh, 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 video okay. a, as a source material for later. Um, feel like a five second segment this week. <laughs> hey guys, I want you to listen to the Ritual Misery podcast <laughs> about the 43 minute mark, not the part where we're talking about you know pinching one off with the door open, but the part where we're talking about verified Twitter accounts. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is one of those things that. Uh, uh, it, no matter how I feel about a platform and their their views, 
I fully endorse the platform being responsible for at least hedging off some of the extreme views on that platform, whether it's Facebook uh, not allowing nudie, nudie pics and nudie videos or Twitter not allowing hate speech. It's your platform. It's not a freedom of speech to say whatever I want on your platform. It is your platform to say what you want on your platform. And I'm just a part of that. Um, and I know Which, a lot of sports spoiler. That's also part of what I'm covering. Is, you, right. You know, it's, it's not a freedom of speech issue. So. It, it's, it's really not. Uh, it's, it's, um, it, it would be freedom of speech if the internet tried to shut us down for being assholes in the internet and we were running our own server. It's not freedom of speech for me to be shut down by Twitch for being an asshole on Twitch. That's, that's the freedom of Twitch. <laughs> freedom of Twitch. Yeah, exactly. I have a freedom to tweet, damn it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's, uh, it, it, we, we, we are, as responsible citizens of the internet, we are required to filter our experience on the internet and to filter those, uh, I, don't, I don't say subordinate, but those who fall under us, like our kids and things like that, those are who aren't as, as experienced in the world as we are. So it, it's not, it's not on, unre- on, un, un, uh, it, it happens on a regular basis that we will go through our kids' social media accounts and just see what's there and kind of tailor that a little bit. Not, not denying them their freedom of expression, but definitely filtering out some of the, the, the fringe shit yeah. that we don't want involved in their lives, at least not until they're responsible enough well, to, yeah. to tenor it in themselves. Use, them as, use those things as teaching moments. Right. Right, and it's never. I, I think it's, it's absolutely. Important. And it's never a punishment either. It's it's always well. Let's sit down and talk about this person or this account or, you know, and, and we and we do that on a regular basis because we're yeah. responsible parents. Yeah, don't ever stop doing that. That <laughs> that is incredibly important. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I dig it. Hey, um, let's get to something a little less controversial. It helps when they have the slider up. <laughs> Uh, and we have a treat for you today. Uh, we have Alan Siegel. Let's simplify legal jargon. Uh, Kent, this is another one of your infamous uh, sub five minute videos. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, last week I chose the shortest one I could find because it was short. This one I chose because of the subject matter. It just happened to be short. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to keep this part short because we have a second TED Talk. Mm. And I, I want to spend our time there. Uh, This basically is a guy talking about how legal jargon is ridiculous and we should just make it shorter. So like a, a, like let's just take a EULA, for example, an end user's licensing agreement for software. It's, you know, several pages long. They say you must read this EULA and then click the box saying that you read it and then click agree. Who the fuck reads those? Nobody. There's like there's like three people on this earth that actually does that. And we're about to find but out we all is one of them. Box. We all say agree. <laughs> well, hell no, I got guy... better things to do with my time than read a <laughs> yeah. Eula. This, this guy is he's a uh, lawyer in like actually working in the industry and doing innovative things with with the um, the language of, of things like this, not just Eulas, uh, but just. Um, you know, the, the credit card agreements, things like that. Things that we just kind of like, ah, it's too much to read. Okay, I'll sign. Uh, he has done a very good job of, of converting all of that, that legalese into Simple just plain speech. English, get to the fucking point and understand what it is you're signing so that you can sign it. And, you know, he, he's gotten things, you know, multi page, like, you know, dozens of pages, if not hundreds of pages, down to a readable, digestible page of material. Uh, that so that you can, you know, not spend a lot of time on, understand it and sign it. And I think that's, I, I think that's great. That's okay. the way. That's absolutely the way it should be. Okay, Dave. So engineering jargon or legalese? Which one's easier to understand? Engineering jargon. <laughs> Uh, I hesitate because I'm a patent attorney and we have our own special hell, which is technical jargon and legal jargon mixed together. So if you read a patent, it is the farthest thing from the English language you will ever read. It's it's a disaster. Uh, we we get to make up our own words and stuff, which sounds great, but it's really not. Uh, so. The problem is you got to make up your own words the same way everybody else is making up their own words. That's true, but we actually have a legal like theory. It's you could be your own lexicographer, which yes, it, that's as stuck up as it sounds. 
And Jesus. We, Esquire. Make up our own words. Yeah, as long as we define them clearly somewhere, we can use and make up our own words. So good for us. Uh, but that's the problem in legal world is, okay, if you're dealing with a truly innovative science, maybe you do need to make up words. But when you're talking about credit card agreements and tax form, IRS forms and things, uh, what stood out to me is Siegel is actually putting you know, this into practice. He's actually helping get some of those IRS forms and things changed to where they are readable. And at the end of the day, as a just generally as an attorney, the one thing that I can tell every member of my family, every friend, every acquaintance I meet is do not ever sign a contract without understanding everything in it. That is the one thing you learn in law school that is a life lesson that applies across the board. And most people have to learn that the hard way. Uh, get it in writing and understand the writing. And unfortunately, with a lot of these form contracts, you just, there's a lot of hidden legalese and jargon that's that's meant to give them outs and screw you over. And we need to just do away with that, right? It, you should be able to win business, like win a credit card, a business from a client or a consumer, just on your own merits. You shouldn't have to protect yourself with this, you know, garbage that, you know, you can use in a lawsuit later. We shouldn't be in that mindset. So I think he's doing a really good public service and and that's exactly the type of thing that even as an attorney, I, as a common citizen, I just wish it were more the case. Mm. Now, this one, Alan Siegel was followed immediately because I, I couldn't find. So Dave put one in and you know, gave me one by chat and I went to put it in the show notes and I couldn't find a link for it. Like in, in you know, in regular language, like it was like the t.co. Blah, 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 blah. And then like it was driving me nuts. So I was trying to do that while I was watching the Alan Siegel one. Well, well guess what video followed the Alan Siegel one? Oh, Philip K. Howard, Four Ways to Fix a Broken <laughs> Legal System. It followed right in line. I was like, oh, shit, it just did my work for me. Great. So this one, I, this one's a little longer. And this th this is one of those talks, okay, when you're doing a TED Talk, you have like 18 minutes, whatever, right? Maximum, yeah. Right. A lot of times people go over, but they're kind of loofy about it. They, they There's pauses, and they want to get a little bit of a dramatic effect. And this one, Philip K. Howard, he shoves so much information in here that at the end, you can see the relief on his face that he didn't cross the line because he was going and going. Like, it was just a constant data flood this entire, like, 16 and a half minutes that he went through this. This one was great. You're talking about the content rich. I did. I, I know I'd ha I've already seen this one, and I would have to watch it three or four more times to fully get everything he thumps out there. Yep, lots of information. Um, Dave, this one's called Four Ways to Fix a Broken Legal System. Can you summarize that up? in a, um, like in a, uh, uh, Alan Siegel style. Do, do I have 140 characters or 280? <laughs> <laughs> well, we will allow you 280. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, uh, so <laughs> generally speaking, what, like the first concept of the four ways to fix the system is to put in, you know, clear, put in only so many legal boundaries as you need to, you know, set very clear, uh, boundaries on what's appropriate, what's not, and don't overcomplicate things. And then uh, I'm skipping a couple of steps, but at the end, he couples that with kind of his final step, which is to allow judges to apply a human touch, which means part of the reason laws are so convoluted when they're written is that when they're debating them in Congress or state houses or wherever, they are worried about every little anecdote, right? So they put a proposal out there and then, you know, Johnny and Sammy and so many people will come with these anecdotes and then they try to cover every situation with the law to make it fit these weird situations. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, if you're going to write in plain English, there are going to be situations that just don't fit. There's going to be exceptions to every rule. And you have to, his point is, you have to allow judges the ability to have that discretion, that human touch to say, you know, we're not going to be so rigid in applying laws that are written yeah. like that. Um, and regardless of your philosophy on how judges should interpret or apply laws the way they're currently written, I think under his system, that makes sense. But you need that extra human touch there because you wouldn't have everything covered by the, the lawmaking yeah. side of things. So I actually wrote this down. This is a, this is a direct quote um, about a minute, maybe about 30 seconds before the end of it. It says, you can't run a society by the lowest common denominator. And yeah. that was like, that was the one punching thing that really kind of went through all of it. And it sums it all up very, very nicely in exactly what you were saying. It, it like, yeah. 
Well, you know, it, as much as that's the thesis or like the statement of the problem, I think the the best way to sum up the solution is to empower common sense. Because what we have done with our laws is basically written out, you, like pretty much like Dave was saying, well, we've written out the basically the authority of a judge to decide that, okay, that's just fucking silly. Because the, the lawyer is going to argue that, well, but the law says right there on line 37, it says it, it takes out, it, it takes away the judge's authority to, to I, I guess, invoke, even invoke common sense. He has to merely interpret the way that the law is written. And, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to agree with Howard on, on this, like, you know, empower the judges to actually employ their wisdom. You know, the, the point of a judge, you have a judge so that you have someone to be wise and make a decision. That's why we don't have robots just, just automatically spit out a verdict when you, you know, type in the, the crime or whatever. Um, but then we yeah, do, we it, do have judges. Re-empower, are... re-empower common sense. We do, I think we that do, is the we do have federal judges that are taking seats without ever actually having tried a case. So uh, yeah, I know, mean that's the kind of that's part the, the kind of well, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that might be symptomatic hey, of of the larger. I, I could get a federal judgeship. I mean, based on the qualifications <laughs> these days. I mean, you're, yeah, you can definitely. Refer to me as your honor. <laughs> <laughs> Your well, Honor, uh, um, David Fitzgerald II, Esquire. Esquire, yeah, yeah. all uh, of it. The, all the, of it. The, the thing that got me about this, and the reason I really mentioned going from Alan Siegel to Philip K. Howard, because they did go right in a, in a row, the next video yeah. was one by Lawrence Lezig, which he's one of my favorite people when it comes to law and interpreting it and breaking it down and, and fighting for the common purpose. Um, he's run for president based on this making simple, you know. I, I follow him on Twitter. He's, he's Sometimes it's way over my head. Sometimes it's right in line with my thinking. And uh, I thought it was great that it went from, from the two TED Talks we went through to Lawrence Lysak on the next one. And Lawrence, again, has another tie-in with Kent this episode. <laughs> Oh, the first name? Yeah, the first name. <laughs> <laughs> Look, don't ever yeah. it. I'll tie everything the, the in. Kent's I don't my care. my middle name, for anyone that didn't realize. Kent is my middle name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Uh, we, got a, we got a few other things to, to take care of here. Let me make sure this is loaded up properly. Um, we have, for a long time, been asking people, hey, if you send us a, 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 a thing, kind of like what, uh, what Dave does with, with Current Geek, if you send us something... We'll include it in the show, especially if it's if it's promoting something that we enjoy. And there's something me and Kent really enjoy, and that's beer. And something we really enjoy, and that's podcasting. And, well, we happen to know some people that do a podcast about beer. Well, the Have a Drink folks sent us a segment, and we are going to show that now, I think. Let me make sure I can get this right. Hello, Ritual Misery. Brittany Lee Walker here from Have a Drink. Today, I'm trying the Alaskan Smoked Porter from Alaskan Brewing Company. This beer comes in at 6.5% ABV and 45 IBUs. And this beer actually kickstarted the smoked beers back into the craft beer scene. This particular bottle is a 2013 vintage. The description from the brewery notes, Alaskan Smoked Porter is produced in limited vintages each year on November 1st. And unlike most beers, may be aged in the bottle much like a fine wine. As you can see, it's also really dark in the glass because it's a porter. It smells and tastes very smoky and a bit of chocolate on the taste as well. Very good and I would highly recommend it, if, especially if you're a fan of porters at all. Uh, to learn more about smoked beers, check out one of our recent audio episodes on your podcatcher of choice. For more tastings and education on what you drink, check out Have a Drink Show on twitch.tv and social media or haveadrinkshow.com. Thanks. There we go. Yep, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Brittany and Have a Drink Show. If you guys are not familiar with them, uh, head over to twitch.tv slash haveadrink. They are fantastic. They're wonderful people, and their show is awesome. Twitch.tv slash haveadrinkshow. Is that what it is? Yeah. See, that's what I thought it was. Yeah. And somebody, yeah, okay. So it is Have yeah. a Drink Show. <laughs> Verified. <laughs> it is twitch.tv slash Have a Drink Show. Um, and having a, having a drink with some folks might be a good thing if you're part of the Diamond Club movie party this Saturday. Hell yeah, man. You guys know Poodle Puncher. Half the time he's in our chat. He's not here tonight. 
but he's a good friend of ours. Uh, he is the host, one of the hosts of the VOD Squad. He also, once a month, along with Sassian, put on the Diamond Club movie party. Uh, it's a chance for everybody to get together and watch a typically a really crappy movie and make fun of it, MST3K style. Uh, this Saturday, we are going to be doing the movie party. Uh, don't think Sassian is going to be there because she's going to be on an airplane. Uh, but I am going to be there along with Poodle Puncher to watch Thanks Killing and The Ghost in the Invisible Bikini. So if that sounds like a good time, uh, check us out. That is going to be at uh, 9 p.m. Central Time on... Uh, well, actually, you know what? I tell you what. Go to... Ah, oh, crap. I just lost it. Go to uh, <laughs> at DC Movie Party on Twitter. Uh, check it out. It, it's got all of the information about how to get to it and all of that. 9 p.m. Um, otherwise you can. Otherwise, you can hit up uh, Poodle Puncher on Twitter as well, at Poodle Puncher, and he will guide you into exactly how to experience that. Uh, good times, good times, good times. Um, it says on here we got a big shout-out to Big Jim and Hot Beverages. Yep. I got to shout out my local Diamond Club peeps. Occasionally, we will very occasionally go out to a, a lunch or a drink together, and and we are representing Southwestern Ohio. Well, at least Emily Hot Beverages is for a little while longer. She's moving to Texas, but um, but the, at least for cool now, all the are moving to Texas. We, we, That's what we I've holding the flag high. So, <laughs> um, actually, Hot Beverages is, is how we were introduced to the Have a Drink Show folks uh, initially as well. Exactly. I was actually. Very near, probably about uh, an hour and a half, two hours away from Hot Beverages on a business trip in Kentucky. And uh, I, I'd sent out on Twitter like, hey, who's in the area that might want to get together for a Diamond Club thing? And uh, she, like, within five minutes was like, uh, me? Hello? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, cool. I thought you were in um, Ohio. And she's like, well, I am I mean, basically, but I'm technically in Kentucky. I was like, oh, cool. Uh, yeah, let's hook this thing up. So. Uh, went up and visited her, and she's like, hey, come on, we're headed over to our friend Chris and Brittany's house. I'm like, oh, I'm not familiar with them. Who are they? And, uh, yeah, it turns out that they are, uh, well, at least half of Have a Drink Show. And so I got to experience their podcast and their uh, personal awesomeness uh, all at once, and it was it was really great. And uh, Emily is fantastic. Actually, I got to meet Big Jim at nerdtacular mm. this year and he's a pretty awesome dude as well you know who he didn't meet in nerdtacular this year dave dave fitzgerald the second this guy, <laughs> this guy right here <laughs> i even i even got a shout out on the big stage it was like awesome i finally got the shout out for after after submitting segments for many years i i got but my did, little shout out like it, hey the legal guess... geeks here it's like yay here i am and away you go so <laughs> <laughs> but did you have a dtns audience sing happy birthday to you while you were on stage no. <laughs> well, okay. Got you beat on something at least. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks to th thanks to Amos. Uh, I was presented my birthday gift at the during the post show of DTNS, and uh, that was that, that was one of the coolest things that's ever happened. Actually. Uh, well, I mean, it, that's that's how I roll. So don't expect the next. <laughs> don't expect the same with the next nerdtacular. I'm just saying. <laughs> right, well, I'm well, gonna hold well you played. to it. <laughs> I like to come in at the last moment, last minute, go in hard and and, and leave before I'm noticed. Um, I think Brian Brushwood actually recently said that uh, once Scott comes to his senses and and realizes what the rest of us know, that Nerdtacular will be back. <laughs> okay, so here here's a quick update on uh, on on Ritual Misery and our our Patreon and everything else. We well, as far as I know, as as far as I can gather, we I will not make it to South by this year. Um, we. Okay. The way I'm looking though is maybe instead of South by we can hit a, a, a diamond or a, a Dragon Con this year, and that will that'll make the uh, the triumvirate at least so it will have hit each one, um because we've never been to Dragon Con neither neither, neither me or Kent have ever been to Dragon Con, um sure. and uh, that'll that that might be determined immediately after we know for sure that there's not a Nerdtacular next year. But I will say, out of the three experiences, even have never been to Dragon Con, I'm going to tell you that my favorite experience was Nerdtacular. Um, oh, yeah. It was easily the 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 the, the most uh, uh, casual and the the most uh, personable experience of them. 
And it was like being completely removed from the world into a place where it's just the people you already want to hang out with. Yeah. And I, I think, I think Nertaki was just completely amazing. Oh yeah. It was, it was one of the most amazing three days of my life. I, and that's, I mean, I've had some amazing experiences in my life, and it's, I would say that Nerdtacular was probably top ten. And yeah, uh, yeah, it's not hyperbole. I'm serious. It was absolutely freaking now, amazing. Now you got people that have been like the, every Nerdtacular, like ah, it's okay, man. I liked it better in the theater. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, a caveat to this: this is our, uh, you know, mine and Amos's one and only Nerdtacular experience was right. was uh, uh, Nerdtacular ten, and. Um, yeah, or in seventeen, or whichever whichever version of the name you want to call it. Uh, but yeah, it was it was absolutely just amazing. Now, Dave, are you going to make it to South by anytime soon? Probably not. I'm more likely to make it to Atlanta for Dragon Con at some point. Uh, again, <laughs> if I can give a talk to game designers and get an expense, that'll be mm, so good, so good. Well, there um, you go. <laughs> I'll be right there. <laughs> that actually fits into South by too, for what it's worth. But it does. <laughs> uh, but no, and I went to three Nertaculars myself. They were all in the Snowbird era, so I I don't I wasn't familiar with the the older ones when they were down in the valley or at the theater. Uh, and obviously, being from so far away, I wouldn't have gone probably just for the movie. But uh, regardless, the community that uh, Scott Johnson and, and his various uh, cohorts have put together, when they get together, it is just something to to experience and it's, it's really hard to describe i've never been to a convention like that i went to the one in 2014 and i kind of immediately said we'll be coming even though this is so damn far away in utah like we will make it a priority to get out here to this thing uh because it i mean just the way that they welcome you and again in 2014 i was kind of pretty fringe right i, I was doing legal geek at that point but i hadn't been doing it for like more than six months and just the conversations and stuff you get into, even if you're just, you know, kind of a fringe member of the community uh, that doesn't put up a lot of content or stuff, you still just feel welcome and like family. Um, and, and that was my main takeaway from this year's was what a perfect shirt to go out on. Uh, it said Nerdtacular, like family, except with nerds. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a really perfect description of what that convention's like. Um, and it's yeah. a shame that it may be over, at least for a little while. Um, but quite frankly, it could be hard to keep that magic going because if they get bigger and bigger, it's going to be hard to keep that same, you know, I, I have trust in the community, but it's going to be hard to keep that same vibe, so. Yeah, it, it was already getting to the point where, you know, just a few hours after tickets were released, there were no more tickets to be to be had. You know, it was already getting to that point, so you start getting yeah. into that BlizzCon field, field of, well, <laughs> should we do a lottery to find out who's going to go, you know, and th that starts Oh, to, that gets nasty. Yeah, yeah. exactly, but uh, I, and I think the because it was so small and um, and so isolated, really. I mean, it was what twenty miles down to the valley. Um, that yeah. really added to the to the atmosphere of it and everything else. I think it's been great. Uh, and yeah. It's a gorgeous place. I mean, just the mountains in general. When you're from flat country, relatively flat yeah. country like me, uh, <laughs> yep, it's it's majestic. And then just to be able to hang out at the mountain resort when you're not you know doing nerdy stuff, it's it was. I think it was the whole mix of everything really. Yeah. Uh, made that magical for most of us that went so and there was yeah. never that conversation of hey uh what do we have in common you know there's always something in whether it's games or just general nerdiness or somebody yeah, you I mean, recognize who you the are fact, you recognize something they've been doing it's just it's amazing yeah beyond beyond the fact that you're a frog pants listener or watcher or yeah. fan or whatever and, whatever you want to term that and unlike there's, south there's, by you're typically sober enough to remember <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah i mean and this not to be you know we're not saying that there aren't drinks had at snowbird uh there definitely are but it's like you know south by it's like all right let's get fucked up and get ready for whatever diamond club event yeah it's uh you know it, at snowbird or at nerdtacular it's let's experience this frog pants thing and then you know and then maybe afterward we'll we'll grab a drink or two yeah yeah it's you don't you don't you don't get pre-hammered for a nerdtacular event <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, hey, uh, next week we have. Well, we, next week I don't. I don't know if we're gonna be doing a show next week. M next week might be a week off. It might be something small. Um, no yeah, guarantees either way. Next week is Thanksgiving. Yeah, next week is is the, is the Thanksgiving. I have four generations of my wife's family in the house right now. My ninety eight year old grand great great grandmother in law. Uh, I don't even know how that works. Grandmother, oh my whatever. God. So she's okay. here. Uh, my mom, my 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 
my wife's grandma's here. My wife's mom is here. My wife and her sister are here. And then, of course, there are what five children of the that fourth generation. So I may be spending next week uh, befuddled in great food because, well, that's what they came here for was to cook, uh, cook and laugh. And they've been doing plenty of laughing, so I'm waiting for that cooking start. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, next week might be may, we may we may come on here for like a five minute thing or whatever, but don't expect anything big. Uh, the week after that, I believe we have Mike TV finally coming on the show in proper. Um, that is like 98% at this point. Yeah. Yeah. He was, a, he was a guest once before, but I was not on that episode. Right. He was kind of like a fill in guest for me, apparently. Yeah. It, uh, it, was, it was him and, uh, and, uh, 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 jury facts. Right. That's right. Ron, yeah. 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 Post and uh, man, I, I I watched that show after the fact, and it was it was so much fun. Um, I mean, everyone knows that you know how Mike TV is just you know fantastic dude. And uh, for for some of our viewers that might not know Jury Facts, he is a hella entertaining guy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I was so upset that I had to miss that show. Well, uh, so you, I'm really looking forward to next. But week. you made uh, this one, and this is the one that Buckeye Fitzy was on. So thank you very much to Dave. Where can people find more stuff that you that you're involved in and and all your uh, your anecdotes about the failings of Ohio State. <laughs> Only against mediocre teams from the state of Iowa. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I digress. I'm surprised you didn't correct me and say the Ohio State. Okay, I'll give you that. Well, I, I was <laughs> deposed. So, all right, all right. Side story. I'm, it's already been an hour and a half. I'm so sorry. But you're not going to get a full show next week. So here you go. You're going to get a two-hour <laughs> show with me. So I had the pleasure of being deposed for the first time ever uh, because I did an opinion. And of course the opinion that we had didn't work because our client got sued by the people that we thought they didn't infringe. And so it comes out in the defense that they think, Hey, we've got a reasonable defense. Even if we infringe, we, we did so not willfully because we had an opinion done and we think we're clear. So that's a lot of backstory, but that's what's going on. That means because I was participating in the opinion as like a first year associate fresh out of law school, I have no earthly idea why the partner had me sign it, but regardless, he's retired. So now I'm the jerk that they have to track down and like pick this opinion apart. And it's really different being on the other side of that table, being the witness, <laughs> right? Oh so, boy. Yeah. So they're doing the establishing questions and this client's from North Carolina. So, you know, they know I've got a Buckeye background and the Ohio state degrees, but they're, you know, not Ohio folks, uh, but regardless, we're sitting there. And the counsel is is grilling me on my background. And at some point, he you know asks, where did I go to the engineering school? And I respond, the Ohio State University, like with emphasis, because that's what we do. <laughs> and then he asked, where did I go to law school, which is also the same. And I said, the Ohio State University. And I could just see my client and the, and the counsel on, on my side of the table just chuckling like, Oh my God, it is real. Like they do really. <laughs> <laughs> Even in a legal setting, they do it. It's it's weird. So, so yes, that's that's my side story from recently about uh, using it. So there you go. Oh, um, as far as far as where you can find me uh, when I'm not diverting the podcast on various tangents, uh, I am easily found on Twitter at Buckeye Fitzy. That's Buckeye. If you're not familiar with Ohio State, that's B-U-C-K-E-Y-E -E and F-I-T-Z-Y. Uh, I'm pretty much the same on all, all other platforms. Uh, if you want to friend me on Hearthstone, it's Buckeye Fitzy 1585 and so on and so forth. Um, like I said, I still am in the background of some sports writing activities, even though I don't do it anymore. And I promise I'm making it through the season. I will be okay. I keep telling myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> this is a nice therapeutic experience but if you want to check out my former website it's at talking 10 if you're not into big 10 football and watching the iowa hawkeyes crush a far superior team like the ohio state Buckeyes, then you probably don't want to go there because that's the type of stuff that we write about there so if you're if you're not big 10 slanted that's not going to be for you um but like i said everything you can find me on twitter and then of course current geek and this week in track i do weekly segments on each of those so Enjoy those. If you have people you want me to cover, characters you want me to cover, or legal topics, please always feel welcome to send them my way. Excellent. 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 <laughs> if people are interested in me and my goings on, uh, check me out, rm first, underscore first of, first of all, First Twitter. of all, if someone's interested in you and your goings on, what is wrong with them? They need to go find legal counsel or mental advice, all right? So, so do that first, <laughs> and then once you've recovered, come find me on Twitter at rm underscore del noche. I'm pretty much Del Noche everywhere else 
uh, except for uh, Twitch, I'm Del Noche 77. So I don't know. So just type in Del Noche and see what comes up, and that's probably me. Amos, what about you? I am Ethan Kane on uh, on on Twitter and Twitch, um, and I don't know where else. Pretty much everywhere else, unless it's not me, then of course it's not me. Um, but you can find me in all those places at Ethan Kane, um, and of course you can follow the show at Ritual Misery, and now our new spot on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Ritual Misery. Um, and uh, uh, there's a bunch of stuff over here that I'm supposed to read right now that I can't see because my mic's in the way. Uh, you'd think after 150 episodes of the same shit, I'd be able to do this without looking at it, but I can't because I'm just not that special. Uh, you can follow the show at Ritual Misery on the Twitter. You can see my ideas on our subreddit, ritualmisery.reddit.com. You can find all these links and more ways to support the show and give feedback at our website, ritualmisery.com. I'm going to hit this little button right now. And then I'm going to thank Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use his music uh, and especially for being a guest on the show several episodes back. That was a great time. Uh, thank you for listening. For Kent, for Dave, for me, and for you, this has been your Ritual Misery Podcast. And Kent, this is what a real beard looks like. See ya. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>